Out of every tier list I've done, there is one that never saw the light of day. The largest, most awkward arrangement of somewhat goofy boss fights with a large handful of straight up bangers. I give you Dark Souls 2 all bosses ranked from easiest to hardest. The criteria I'll be using for this run will be based on my personal experience, having ran the game hitless for any percent and played through the game casually while level one up to new game plus three. For consistency's sake, I'll be referencing some strategies that you mainly would see on an all bosses hitless run as well. The best part of the tier list is that we get to start off with a boss that literally kills itself, and it's not even scripted. I give you Dragon Rider. The Dragon Riders were guardians of King Vendrick. Together with the King, they helped found Drang Lake by crushing its former inhabitants and building the kingdom upon their graves. The armor and weaponry they utilized demanded a great amount of skill and inhuman strength to wield. It is believed those who aspire to join the Dragon Riders trained in the likes of taming their dragons. Those who failed were torn apart, while the successors gained immense strength. The weapons of the Dragon Riders were imbued with magic and included a halberd, a twin blade, and a bow, with their strategy likely focused around having a large reach from atop their dragons. The Dragon Riders we encounter in Drang Lake are found at the Tower of Flame in Hyde and the Royal Treasury of Drang Lake Castle. The Dragon Riders were clearly trusted by Vendrick and seem to be placed either to protect the areas they are in or to oppose any undead who would come after the king. They're weak to fire and lightning, but also stronger against magic and dark, indicating that they have since hollowed. Normally, Dragon Rider would be a tricky fight compared to some of the other early bosses if done immediately, due to the low amount of adaptability points you likely leveled from the time that you made it to him. Even though your rolls would look 100% accurate in the context of any of the other Dark Souls games, they just won't work because the B-team loves to trash our egos as quick as possible. Thankfully, there is a strategy so grimy, so simply outrageous, that it doesn't require you to physically hit him at all. You can legitimately run and jump across the gap on the right corner of the platform and make him lunge himself into the pits of doom below. Heck, you could even just walk across it. You don't even have to jump. For someone who is challenging you in his own arena that he's likely familiar with, this is just plain stupid. What a goofball. One of the coolest looking bosses with easily the most unique entrance of any special enemy in the game. Not only can you fight him before you actually reach him in his arena, but when you do, there is a contraption that only appears one time in any Souls game period that I'm aware of. The Pursuer. Rumored to have been a cursed knight, similar to the Paladin Leroy. Pursuers were given a mission to atone for their sins, to hunt down and kill all bearers of the Dark Sign. What we know for sure is that the Pursuer will hunt those who are undead. It has a large quiver on its back that carries an array of weapons, presumably looted from beings like us who are defeated in battle. The Ring of Blades can only be gained by defeating the Pursuers scattered across Drang Lake, and its text indicates that it was made in Alkin, which introduces the theory that they may originate from there. The Pursuers are very susceptible to lightning damage and can be poisoned. These two facts alone indicate that they are both hollow and human. The pronoun he is also associated with them in the descriptions. The Pursuers' associated descriptions indicate they are carrying out a mindless task given to them long ago, in a similar fashion to the soldiers found in the Forest of Fallen Giants. Though the Pursuer fight is extremely worthwhile without using cheesy methods of any sort, the developers themselves placed a giant ballista in the arena, which if accessed at the right timing with the right positioning, will kill the Pursuer in one combo. You can do this much easier with two players, giving more reason for them to be included in the first place, but a single player can pull off the same type of kill if executed quick enough. I don't think this method is that hard to learn for most beginners, so I would rank Pursuer at number two. Number three. The Last Giant is the only surviving giant of the Cardinal Tower Siege, a war that took place long ago. He is worn down, the remains of a giant lord who have once brought destruction to the entire kingdom of Drang Lake. The giants were eventually defeated by an unnamed hero, but victory came all too late as Drang Lake had already been wiped out. After his defeat, the Giant Lord's remains were dragged beneath the stronghold, where he was sealed away. When the Giants fall, they grow into trees. Death is not the end for them, 
Anything that is lived remains a part of a regenerative cycle. Giant Lord's soul remained magnificent due to his former strength and did not completely become recycled in this process. When we stand before him, the Giant Lord recognizes us. His rage becomes uncontrollable, and he is able to break free from his restraints. This final battle truly displays the determination of the race that once ruined Drang Lake. This is best demonstrated in his will to rip off his own arm and use it as a weapon. Though the dude tries to beat you with his own arm, and once was a much greater boss that has one of the craziest hitboxes in the game, we're going to cover that later in the list, of course. For now, in his current state, Giant Lord is a little too slow for the Chosen Undead. It's likely that with a little bit of practice, that you can do this entire boss fight without even using the roll button. Poking his ankles while running between his legs, and occasionally him falling over himself, makes the fight a breeze, even with no levels invested whatsoever. Number 4. Rat Vanguard While looking very similar to his corpse-hunting rat brethren, what sets him apart is yellow eyes, a longer mohawk, and bigger ears. He's a loyal servant of the Rat King and judges the worthiness of those who seek royal audience by facing them in combat. If defeated, the winner obtains a rat tail and therefore the right to serve under the Rat King. The corpse rats serving under the Rat King inflict petrification, as do the dog rats in the Doors of Pharos. According to an old legend, a great spear was used to defeat Santir, the walking statue. Perhaps Santir was one of the Rat King's subjects, defeated by someone who would seek the right to serve. The Rat King himself confirms that there was a human who was once among us, so perhaps we are not the first to kill a living statue, and thereby earn the right to serve this being. It's possible the Rat King could bring statues to life in his attempts at ruling the Dark Lands beneath the surface. We do see a number of rat statues in the Grave of Saints and the Royal Rat Vanguard's boss chamber. Without particular tools, this could be a little bit annoying, but if you come prepared with the spell Soul Appease and Alluring Skulls, you can easily destroy the additional rats, single out the boss, and spam it into submission for victory. The only reason I would rank this higher than the giant is because it still takes proper timing to execute this type of kill, and without that strategy I would argue that it could give you a lot more trouble. Number 5. The covetous demon was once a man whose deep affections were unrequited. As an expression of desire for the queen, this man ate excessively. Eventually he transformed into the covetous demon, which only made him lonelier than before. To be at the Queen's side at all times, the Covetous Demon must have been an important member of the Queen's court. It was likely he was wealthy before he transformed, as constantly eating is a characteristic of those with riches. The bone scythe associated with Covetous Demon is said to grind flesh apart as opposed to slicing it. This is clearly indicative of the Covetous Demon's teeth, which would grind apart its food. His eating is an expression of desire, and he devours all things, even undead laborers. The fate of man who has become the Covetous Demon is not unique, though. We also have a white-colored Covetous Demon in the lower garrison of Elium Lois. The reason for this is never explained. The white Covetous Demon drops an ivory warrior's ring, either indicating that it ate a warrior wearing this ring, or that it was a warrior who wore this ring before transforming. This roly-poly Jabba the Hutt knockoff is by far the least favorite boss of the entire Soul series, in my personal opinion. Not only is the backstory straight up silly, but the moveset and location is very depressing as well. You should be able to kill Covetous Demon in a single engagement as soon as he does the big lunge attack, but even if he lives, it's not quite enough to put up much of a fight. The only thing that's somewhat cool about this boss is that he can actually eat you and spit you out naked. The game will require you to re-equip everything back on the character, even down to small items like arrows. It's likely even those that have played the game for quite a while have never even seen this, but now you know. Number 6. A giant parasitic spider with two heads on opposite sides of its body. It's made its home within the remains of an ancient dragon's body in the lowermost section of Brightstone Cove Seldora. The Duke's dear Freya is described as the writhing ruins keeper. The Writhing Ruin is an ancient thing whose shadow remains cast over the land. It first took possession of a solitary insect, Freya, 
but grew its power by feasting on the wealth of twisted souls around the land. The Writhing Ruin is the title given to the remnants of Seath the Scaleless Soul. This once magnificent Lord Soul continues to exert influence over the land, even after eons. The soul seems to develop a peculiar fascination with those it possesses. These fascinations take control, till there's very little left of the person or being they once were. Shao Choir tells us that the writhing ruin keeps searching as we speak, searching for its heart's desire. Man Scorpion Tark, a creation by an owner of the soul, says that his master was born with a fatal flaw. He resented those who had what he lacked and became fully mired in hatred. Eventually, he drove himself mad. It was at the peak of this madness that he conjured up Man Scorpion Tark and Scorpion S. Nika. The problem of the writhing ruin is that it never seems to understand what it truly lacks, and it will never stop searching. Tark said that his master never dies, it only changes form, so that it may seethe for all of eternity. Freya is the keeper of the soul. She takes care of it and protects it. She nurtures it and grows its power. It seems that what the Writhing Ruin searches for changes depending on the soul it influences. For Seath the Scaleless, it was about obtaining scales of immortality which he lacked unlike his brethren. When Freya was first influenced by the soul, she was a solitary insect, likely one without much power. But in partnership they grew in power, till eventually Freya was able to overrun the town of Seldora and feast on the twisted souls it contained through her offspring. Freya was also a pet of the Duke of Seldora known by both titles, Duke and Lord, perhaps Lord because he owned the land of Brightstone, and Duke because he was made a Duke in Drang Lake. Within the Lord's private chamber beside Freya's den, we find a small cage with the door broken open. It's likely this cage contained Freya before she grew too large and broke out, indicating her growth and power was rapid. Freya is quite annoying to fight if you attempt her without bringing along a torch. This is due to the small spiders that fill up the arena surrounding her, waiting to pounce as soon as you go in for damage on the boss directly. They also don't contribute to the actual kill of the boss overall, meaning that killing them does not lower the health bar like some other boss fights. The easiest method i found is to bait out the big laser attack that Freya generates from far away, then run around and hit the second head behind her, lay down as much damage as possible before the next attack, and repeat this. You can go over and over with this method until victory, with the torch in your left hand keeping you safe from all the small spiders and nothing else to worry about. One thing that I didn't realize until way later in playing the game is that if you hit her with low enough damage on one of the heads for a long enough period of time, it can literally break off. And I believe you can also break both of the heads off her body, meaning that you actually can't do any damage to kill it. I've only seen this happen once, and the whole prospect of not being able to kill her may not be true, but I'm pretty sure it is. So. Leave a comment if you know some other way how to deal with that. Number 7. Nika was born of the misdeeds of an ancient being. She and Man Scorpion Tark once had a master who created them both long, long ago. So long ago that no one remembers when they were born or where their master has gone. Both Nika and Tark were once human and engaged to each other. They would often be at each other's side, but as time went on, things went south. Nika was a frail soul, and she soon succumbed to the madness. She became violent, raging uncontrollably. Eventually she came after Tark, and they've been locked in combat ever since. Tark asks that you help him kill her. The wounds they exchange are never lethal, and they are at a standstill, waiting for someone to tip the scales. Nika herself is adept at sorcery, and capable of casting both Soul Spear and Homing Soul Mass, which is magic found commonly in Big Hat Logan's array. She attacks with a weapon that's hooked, resembles a spear and a staff simultaneously, and could not be obtained in the game. She wears around her neck a necklace and a pendant shaped like a silver skull. Nika is quite the challenging fight if you don't have enough damage and good positioning within the fight. Most of the swipes and the poke attacks from her weapon are pretty quick, also being able to dig her tail into the ground multiple times. One thing that slows down the momentum quite a lot is when she digs underground, making you just a sitting duck until she resurfaces. The emergence of coming out of the ground is also an attack itself and can knock you over. There's some methods out there that are quite funny, like climbing onto her tail and riding her as the player, but in terms of the most efficient straight up kill with no fancy magic and little preparation, 
Getting behind her on the right angle has a large chance to bait the tail swipe attacks over and over. You can use Stone Ring to chain in a stagger and keep her in submission for quite a while, which should be enough to kill within a few engagements maximum, but often a lot less. I found her homing soul magic quite hard to dodge early in the game, especially with the iframes that you would have with the lower amount of adaptability, which is easily gained later on. But the fact that its release timing is super weird compared to similar attacks in the other games gives you quite a bit of trouble. Number 8. The Flexile Sentry is a merciless creature whose purpose is to supposedly punish the undead. It did this by cramming inmates of the overflowing Lost Bastille onto a rickety ship and casting them out to an open sea. A former king, like its creator, commanded the Flexile Sentry to deliver those who had no cells to a faraway land and make certain they were never heard from again. The majority of these unfortunate souls drowned or starved, but a few survived and made it to the south to spread their knowledge of sorcery. The Flexile Sentry appears to be reptilian in nature, but is conjoined at the base of its spine. Like the Executioner's Chariot, it may reflect the soul of whoever created it in some way. The Warp Sword description says that its weaponry was once straight, but later twisted to reflect its warped owner. Flexile has two options of movesets that it can switch between based on which side that you're fighting, and this makes the fight much easier. The side with the barbed clubs has less reach and is more predictable in being able to bait out slams and combos that leave large windows for punishes. Rarely ever will you get caught in a weird mix-up when knowing how to fight this side properly. The only risky movement will be when Flexile is able to turn around and fight you with its swords. The ship that you fight in slowly fills with water, it's a very interesting feature that never came back in any of the Souls titles. Dark Souls 2 has some other unique arenas, but this one's my favorite gimmick as it changes the rolling and the weight of the battle, adding quite a bit of pressure when you are new to the experience. Number 9. Located in the Undead Purgatory, the Executioner has slain countless undead. When the chariot was created, it took the form of a horrendous mad steed. This mad steed is the one controlling the chariot, despite the hollow executioner sitting atop. The form this steed took was a window into the soul of its master, who may have been the Old Iron King. During the reign of the Old Iron King, he led his best men on hunts for the undead in Huntsman's Copes. Those who were caught were rounded up and thrown into cells. Some were taken to the undead purgatory, where they'd be endlessly tortured. The name of the place implies that it was to cleanse them of their undead curse. The more likely reason is that Old Iron King did not care to try and find a cure for the unfortunate souls, though he may have been able to with his great soul. Necromancers were put in the undead purgatory in order to resurrect the undead so that they could be endlessly tortured. Eventually, these necromancers went hollow themselves, but continue in their old ritual. For a boss ranking lower on the tier list, this backstory is straight up savage. Potentially the spookiest story of the whole game? To make quick work of the chariot, all you need is a handful of alluring skulls, or the spell Yearn, to attract the basic skeletons away from you as you make your way to the necromancers that resurrect him. Killing the necros quickly, then waiting by the gate, allowing the chariot to crash through it makes a huge window alone that should be enough to either kill the boss or get extremely close before it can even get up. The point in which you arrive at this boss fight, whether early or late game, will greatly dictate how much damage you can do. So as usual for the optional content, arriving earlier will probably make it a lot more frustrating. More importantly though, to that fact, there's a dude outside that's a red phantom and he's just stupid if you go super early. There are ways to make him fall off by jumping onto a platform to the right of the bridge, but it might not be super consistent and the run back is not the most fun. Number 10. Greatly resembling Dragon Slayer Ornstein, who guarded the cathedral in Anor Orlando from Dark Souls 1. Some speculation has circulated regarding if Old Dragon Slayer actually is Ornstein. Why or how this almost exact replica of Ornstein ended up in Hyde's Tower is not explained. It's likely that the Old Dragon Slayer is a reincarnation of Dragon Slayer Ornstein's soul, which was gifted to him and the Four Knights by Gwyn. This seems most probable because everything about the Dragon Slayer is described as old, from his soul to his name in battle and even the Old Leo Ring. The four great souls of Gwyn, Nido, the Witch of Isolith, and Seath the Scaleless are also all classed as Old. Old King Soul, Old Dead One Soul, Old Witch Soul, 
and Old Pale Drake Soul. The title of Old seems to be used to refer to something incredibly ancient, an exception being Old Iron King, and perhaps a reincarnation. The total health of Dragonslayer armor isn't that high, around 2800 HP. This makes him quite feasible without a crazy amount of engagements required to kill him early on, especially when using strafing and not rolling every single attack. But if done later in the game, you can make quick work of him. He's not that fast and has reasonable hitboxes, which is kind of rare for Dark Souls too. Number 11. The Ruin Sentinels are creations of the Jailer. They actually have no real form and are only an empty soul haunting suits of armor. The Ruin Sentinels in the Lost Bastille each have a name. They are called Yahim, Elysia, and Riche. The significance of these names is not known. Perhaps these Ruin Sentinels were the originals and still retain some memory of their lives before the process that left them encased in armor. Interestingly, only the Ruin Sentinels in Lost Bastille will throw their shields at you. This action may be a further indication that the Ruin Sentinels of Lost Bastille have personality. The purpose of the Ruin Sentinels appears to be similar of the undead jailer enemies. They are soldiers or guards whose job it is to stand and keep watch. Their position in Lost Bastille indicates they were to keep prisoners from escaping perhaps from the cells prior to the boss fog, or the section connected to Sinner's Rise. Who the Jailer is is unconfirmed, but the face behind the title of Jailer may have changed throughout the centuries. Though Ruin Sentinels are tricky to fight all at the same time, and also one of the few triple boss fights in all the Soulsborne games, it is by far one of the easiest triple boss fights. There is a way to kill them without rolling and barely moving at all. It requires decent placement and precision, but if executed with a build that can do enough damage to eliminate each one in four to five hits total, you will be able to clear the fight even before two of them can target you at the same time, making the whole endeavor a one-on-one -on -one battle. This should be possible to pull off within the first quarter of completion of the game as long as your weapon is quick enough and you have the right amount of stamina and damage. Number 12. The old Iron King commanded the capture of all undead and led his best men on undead hunts. The captured undead were thrown into cells built in the forest that would become known as Huntsman's Copes. These unfortunate souls were tortured and killed mercilessly, and eventually reduced to skeletons. Those in charge of the task of rounding up the undead were overcome by the curse themselves, and the march of time has eroded any difference between the captors and the captives. The skeleton lords were the leaders of these hunts, and the men who were ordered to hunt down the undead were themselves hollowed. With their memories purged in rebirth, they founded a kingdom of bone. The skeleton lords likely forgot what they had been commanded to do due to the undead curse eroding their memory. They retained the knowledge that they once ruled and driven by this memory, established thrones made from bone. The skeleton's lord fight, though available in the early portion of the game, is normally very annoying. There is a countless amount of additional enemies, not including the three main skeleton lords, and they all contribute to the single boss's health bar. The best strategy I've seen for handling them is to kill them very, very quickly, one after the other, then eliminating two bone wheels that spawn right after and immediately throwing alluring skulls, or using the spell Yearn in a corner of the room and spamming the entire crowd of basic skeletons to win. In fights with additional enemies, typically using urine or alluring skulls would not be the best thing, as some enemies just do not pay attention to them, but luckily these skeletons are stupid enough to fall for it. Number 13. Found in the Royal Treasury of Dring Lake Castle. The twin dragon riders were clearly trusted by Vendrick and seemed to be placed as security for the treasures found in the castle. What happened to their dragons is unknown, but it may be that the creatures have since died out while the dragon riders survived due to hollowing. Upon entering the fog gate, if timed well by use of bow or projectile, you can shoot the dragon rider atop of the podium on the left side of the room, getting him to drop down and being able to take him out very quickly before the second one is able to do anything. There will be a single engagement with the second dragon rider that's already on the ground to make it to the one that just fell, but in the meantime, you should be able to kill him before the second one gets to you at all. And even if you don't, this will take a large amount of the damage out of the fight. 
This is not that hard to do once you've practiced it a handful of times, but even if you don't want to take the close-up route, you could probably blast them from far away with various forms of magic and projectiles anyways, making sure that you can secure the kill at least on the one that has less health, which would be the one with the bow that I mentioned before. Number 14. It could be an offspring of the ancient dragon, which had a soul of a giant. Or perhaps the guardian was another experiment of Aldia's. The description of the dragon soul claims that it may have been in the grip of one of Aldia's spells, which doesn't exactly specify the dragon's origin. This big red flappy bird in a cage is one of the most annoying bosses in the game. They had a lot of potential, but just ends up avoiding you and spraying the ground with waves of flames or fireballs from a distance. The few attacks it does have at close range are mainly stomps, beak lunges, and a tail attack. You can bait the foot stomps and get in a decent amount of damage in between each one, as well as shoot the dragon with arrows when it flies and latches onto the cage wall. The fire is really the only challenge of this, and even with good RNG, that attack will delay the fight a lot. Number 15. Gargoyles were centuries created by the ancient gods of Anor Londo. Some were originally made to guard the Bell of Awakening atop of Undead Parish and to patrol the streets of Anor Londo. Since then, gargoyles have appeared in many forms in all the great lands throughout history. They are known to guard castles and forts from ill fortune. The Prince of Alken likely knew about gargoyles and their uses in history. The Prince of Alken, or whoever created these gargoyles, gave them a two-pronged spear, a bident, that imitates a weapon mentioned in ancient texts, so it is clear that they had read about them. The gargoyles of Drang Lake protect the seaward front to the Bell of Ven, held in Elkin. As it is perhaps unlikely that an attempt to stop the bell from ringing would be made from within the Lost Bastille, as the entrance to the Belfry Luna is hidden by a pharaoh's contraption. There are five gargoyles that mysteriously come to life in the Belfry Luna. Some of the statues have had their heads broken off, and like the stone soldiers of Drangleg Castle, they do not rise to attack you. It is interesting to note that some of the gargoyle statues can be found in the King's Treasury at Drangleg Castle in the same room as the Dragon Rider duo. It's possible King Vendrick copied these statues after visiting the Belfry Luna in his travels. After a certain amount of time in the fight, the gargoyles all animate one after the other, and will overwhelm you very fast if you come across this boss fairly early. The best you can do with a melee weapon would be to stagger them as quick as possible, especially if you don't have a lot of damage, but the best combination would be having a lot of stagger and a lot of damage to take them on one-on-one -on -one and not having multiple fight you at once. With a large enough weapon and some sort of buff like Dark Resonant Weapon or Sunlight Blade in combination with the right stats, you should be able to take out most of their health if not one-shot them with a heavy attack. Number 16. The Lost Sinner is a prisoner of Sinner's Rise. Her imprisonment is self-imposed, as the exit to her cell is wide open. She eternally punishes herself for the sins of her past. She does this by remaining imprisoned and by wearing her penal set. A mask that pushes spikes into her face. A straitjacket with a belt that tightly clinches or binds the waists. Handcuffs that restrict the movement of hands and a skirt that the guilty wear in shame. The lost sinner committed what some would be believe the ultimate sin, attempting to light the first flame. No context for her crime is included, but the events described happened a long, long time ago. It repeatedly mentions in her item descriptions that no one knows who this was used to punish and for what reason. It's obvious that she hates the light, and she will extinguish the charcoal burners on either side of the arena when the fight begins. Interestingly, she was willing to leave them burned prior to the Chaos Bug entering her mask. This indicates that she is controlled by the small Chaos Bug we see in the opening cutscene. It's known that the Witch of Izalith was transfigured into such a bug and became the Bed of Chaos, Mother of Demons. These creatures have the ability to control others or at least influence their actions. The Lost Sinner possesses the soul of a Great One, she holds the remnants of the soul of the Old Witch of Izalith. Eons have passed since the Old Witch of Izalith walked the land, but such was her power that it persists even now. Sinner is a very quick boss movement-wise and rushes you down with a greatsword. 
You can avoid most of the attacks very easily, but her backstepping out of range often requires you to position yourself on an angle and get in damage from her side or behind as often as possible. She doesn't use consecutive attacks or combos nearly as often as bosses like Dragon Rider or even Ruin Sentinels, but puts up a decent fight. Coming back later on makes her a lot easier, as she isn't required to progress if you use the trick with farming a great soul, such as the Rotten, four times through Bonfire Ascetics. This would allow you to get one million souls quicker than any other method at that point in the game and open the Shrine of Winter to progress onto Drang Lake Castle, meaning that you don't have to offer all four great souls. Alternatively, you can use any other great soul and do the same method, but Sinner would probably not be the easiest to use. It's likely by this method existing, the developers knew that someone that was having a lot of trouble, but that had killed enough things to have accrued 1 million souls total in their lifetime of playing the game, should be able to progress just like people that had done more actual progress of killing bosses. Number 17. The Prowling Magus story is thematically tied to that of the mages of Ulasil, who lost their minds because the contract with the Abyss. This Prowling Magus may have come to Brightstone Cove on Vendrick's order, or because they were seeking souls. Whatever the case, they seem to have become a figurehead and the leader of the clerical force attached to the Drang Lake Royal Army at Seldora. It's easy to see how this Magus with priestly attendance would have drawn the broken, battered, and scarred people of Seldora to them. The clerics could offer these people healing, and Magus the protection. The clerics of Drang Lake were not viewed with particular reverence, with their positions only being reserved as a nod to tradition. What exactly was this tradition? Well, the order of bishops and priests came from the Way of White, a covenant that was invented by Gwyn and perpetuated by his uncle, All Father Lloyd. The covenant was interested in the continuation of the Age of Fire, and may have had clear distinction between the roles of men and women, as there is an ivory talisman that is only given to women in Dark Souls 1. This information gives us a lot of potential answers. King Vendrick held a lukewarm opinion of the clerics because he was a Dark Lord. He had never taken the true throne, rejected burning himself upon the first flame, and sought any means necessary to end the curse outside of reenacting the first sin. Clerics were there simply as a nod to tradition, kept only as attendance to ceremony. But they did not have power. The clerics that congregate with Magus hold priest chimes that were only given to high-ranking clerics. It's also believed they had high faith because they can cast Sunlight Spear. This fight, alike Skeleton Lords, is not really a boss so much as a small convention of people that are attending some sort of event that the player character decides to crash and are conquest to beat the game. Between Magus and the clerics, there's a decent variety of spells, but the real MVPs are the benches in the room and the undead chilling around them. They become super annoying roadblocks that stop you from dealing damage directly without just going YOLO and risking dying in their face close up while a party takes place all around you. The best bet is to slowly chip away at the additional enemies that don't count toward Magus' boss kill, possibly with an alluring skull or urine, and then chopping them down. Luckily, you can shoot a bow over the benches from the back of the room, and with Stone Ring, you can interrupt the castings of the magic from a distance. Number 18. The Rotten is an amalgamation of undead bodies deep within the Black Gulch below the gutter. The Rotten appears to have begun with an undead trapped in one of the numerous iron cages found throughout Drang Lake, and is held together with chains embracing all things unwanted or tossed away. Over time, the Rotten absorbed so many life forms that he came to possess a wondrous soul of his own. If you look close enough, there is one particular undead on Rotten's shoulder that mimics its movements, like it's controlling them. Shalquire mentions in passing that the Rotten had been at the bottom of the gutter for a very long time, and implies he may have not been rotten from the beginning. When Shalva sank, he may have sheltered those who were fleeing from the Sanctum of the Scorned, which is an unused content name for the Black Gulch Primal Bonfire. Wielding a large butcher knife and surrounded by pits of fire, this fight requires a bit of awareness in where you are placed in the arena. Sticking close to the Rotten seems to be the best method in taking him out effectively, unless using a magic build. Because he is one of four great souls that could be used in the opening Shrine of Winter, you may do him later in the game, which can make the duration of the fight much easier Though I would rank him harder than the Duke's Dear Freya, due to the conditions of the fight mentioned previously, and because Freya's method is much more simple. 
I myself and many other players have experienced terrible scenarios with the Rotten's grab attack. Its hitbox is quite larger than it should be and can grip you in positions that don't always make sense based on your time of rolling. On lower level runs, making sure you completely space this grab attack is important if you don't want to get caught due to the low invulnerability frames on your dodge roll, since level 1 characters can only boost their iframes with items rather than leveling the stat that scales ADP. Number 19. Situated at the top of the Dragon Shrine. The Ancient Dragon is a demigod who lived since the beginning of time. Undead seek the Ancient Dragon's guidance in hopes of breaking the curse through the method of telepathic communication. This ultimately just sounds like a weird dubstep song sample in the actual game, but nonetheless is a unique style of dialogue I've never seen in other Souls titles. The path to the Ancient Dragon is guarded by the Drake Keepers. Eternal guardians of the shrine, ready to defend its master or allow one worthy enough to be granted audience. It's suggested that the ancient dragon is a creation of Lord Aldia, who secluded himself inside a manor to conduct various experiments. But, if the ancient dragon was a genuine creation, it wouldn't have the soul of a giant. This leads to the conclusion that the ancient dragon is not genuine, rather a false deity created by ones who would deceive the laws of fate. Ancient Dragon is by far the largest enemy in the entire game, and due to this design it makes it impossible to see the whole thing at once. While fighting this behemoth, the very best view you can achieve is a portion of its body. Likely its back right foot, which is the common place for most people to kill the boss. It has an extremely large health pool at nearly 20,000 points on regular new game. Even if you were to fight it as late as possible in the progression of your first playthrough, it definitely won't be the quickest battle compared to the other bosses mentioned before. Though the best method seems to be simply attacking its feet, letting it stomp, waiting for the flying animation, then chasing down its tail to survive the fire, it's still an incredibly strong enemy in any regard and will kill you very quickly in comparison to most enemies in the game. Number 20. Queen Mytha was obsessed with getting the attention of the king, which led her to ingesting every known poison she could. She was wed to a prince of a nearby castle and became a princess, eventually this prince becoming king. We know that Mytha is familiar with and can utilize the lost art of puppetry, allowing her to create mannequins to serve at her will. This art belonged to the kingdoms of Ven and Alcan. We also know that the Iron Keep was built upon the land of Ven after the unknown lord we know as Old Iron King forcefully took it. But the prince of Alcan and the princess of Ven had a forbidden love for each other creating a theory that Mytha married the Prince of Alcan, but the position of Alcan does not make sense as a nearby castle. We know that Ven was in the same position as Iron Keep, so Mytha marrying a prince from Ven seems more likely. It would be likely that as a queen of Ven during the old Iron King's takeover, she would be beheaded to confirm Ven's defeat. After this beheading, it may be that the poison somehow revived her. Alternatively, she may have been beheaded because she had become a monster, and like Theseus killing Medusa, monsters are often targets of brave warriors. Mytha was considered very beautiful and she knew this, but when she was married she realized that her husband the king did not love her. He had feelings for another. She attempted to increase her beauty at any cost. In ancient times, lead was common in Roman cosmetics. Cinnabar and red lead were used despite the knowledge that they were poisonous. Malachite was used as a green eyeshadow, and this too was poisonous. These ideas may have provided the inspiration for Mythos' character. In her obsession, her transformation was likely achieved through toxic cosmetics or simply ingesting poison. Mytha has quite the weird character model shape, and because of this, depending on what type of weapon you're using, thrusts and pokes can completely miss her body, even though sometimes while locked on. She doesn't have an extreme amount of health, but can cast variations of soul spears from her head that she holds in her hand and even throw that head at you, then dive to pick it up. With extremely quick poke attacks on the spear, a lunge that goes fairly far in terms of travel, a backside punish with her tail and overall quick movement, Mytha is a decent challenge especially on lower level runs or leveled characters when you first make it to the area. As a bonus, the surrounding area of the boss fight is a poisonous moat which doesn't make things much easier. Number 21. The Royal Rat Authority is a massive dog rat and a servant of the Noble Rat King. Residing in Doors of Pharos outside the Rat King's chamber, 
Those who choose to serve the Rat King must have the courage to face the Royal Rat Authority in combat. If one defeats the Royal Rat Authority, they will gain a tail and therefore the right to serve under the Rat King. This boss can be difficult if you don't eliminate the dog rats that are at a good distance from the entrance to the boss room. A bow is recommended, but long range spells can also do the job. There is most definitely a reason the bonfire is right before the entrance. Even with the rat dogs dead, attempting this boss early on can be extremely janky, and with its oddly shaped character model and mainly only having access to his feet, you definitely have to be careful for any swipes, headbutts, and lunges in the meantime. Later in the game he is much easier to kill, but making sure the additional rat dogs are dead first is non-negotiable and one of the reasons I'd still rank this boss higher in the list. That, and well, like who even likes this guy? I'm just, who, who likes this thing? Stupid Ratatouille Lady in the Tramp Remix? Number 22. When the Demon of Song developed a taste for human flesh, it was contained within the Shrine of Amana. A line of priestesses were put in place to look after the shrine and appease the demon by sacred rituals, but they have since died or gone hollow, and over time the tradition was lost, resulting in the demon being set free. The demon gained knowledge and learned to lure humans into its lair. It's called the Demon of Song because it sings with a sonorous voice to lure people close, so that it may devour them. It sings the song of the Milfanito. Within close proximity to its lair, we find a Melfanito, who appears to be hollow and cannot sing. It may be that the Demon of Song somehow stole her voice. The sacred rituals that the priestesses performed were still unknown. It may be that they sang to the demon like the line of priestesses in Shalva, the Sunken City. This may be the case because the Archdrake sect, who the now hollow priestesses of Amana fight with, almost certainly originated in Shelva, and may have therefore passed on the rituals of their priestess line. The demon appears to have been contained prior to the player entering the Shrine of Amana. The spotted whip that can be created from the Demon of Song's soul is coated in poison. The Demon of Song itself does not deal any poison damage, but in real life, frogs do contain poison and it does resemble a frog, so maybe there's some sort of correlation there. The demon drops the key to the embedded, how it came to possess this key is unknown. However, there are quite a few similarities between both of them. The Demon of Song's soul description says that it developed a taste for human flesh, while the key to the embedded says the embedded realized that he could never resist the temptation of flesh. When the embedded realized he couldn't resist, he bound himself in chains, and when the Demon of Song's appetite was realized, it was contained in the shrine. The embedded bears all for anyone to see, hiding only his face behind the mask. The Demon of Song hides within the body of a toad and is only a face, arms, and hands. The sickly pale skin color they both share is evident. The boss cannot be damaged unless you attack its internal form either in the head directly or the arms that flail at you. It has some attacks from a distance that can be quite annoying to deal with and a body slam at medium distance that has virtually no warning signs whatsoever. Killing this boss before that particular attack happens was always a huge priority on hitless runs of my own. And though it doesn't affect the casual player or a level 1 run as much, this enemy is still quite diverse. Its grab, though having a slower startup, will repeatedly slam you into the ground as well. It sucks if it happens to you, but it looks really funny though. Number 23. A clerical knight from a faraway land who is lured to Drang Lake, but forgot why he came. Sir Velstat was always at King Vendrick's side, as if he were his lord's own shadow. Velstat and his fellow knight Raim, currently known as Fume Knight, were known as the right and left arms of King Vendrick. That was until their wills clashed and they fought. Velstat defeated Raim, and Raim was deemed a traitor. The exiled Raim left in search of greater power, and the royal Aegis Velstat remained at his post. After the king retired to the undead crypt, Velstat followed, never to return. The knights in his service waited patiently for his return until eventually turning to stone. Velstat and his armor, originally imbued with the power of miracles, were soaked with dark after extended exposure to the crypt. His appearance resembles Garl Vinland, a cleric knight from Demon Souls, and his hammer, that of Paladin Leroy from Dark Souls. I believe they both imply that Velstat was a cleric, a believer in the Age of Fire, one descended from the Way of White. When reading about Vendrick, it's made clear that Drang Lake was not a place for a cleric with any ambition. 
Clerics of Drang Lake were not viewed with particular reverence, and their positions were only preserved as a nod to tradition, as I had mentioned earlier. Vendrick ordered his royal aegis and royal guard to put death to anyone who came after him, resulting in Veldstadt's hollowing. He quietly remained, awaiting anyone who might seek the king's company, a night filled with purpose following a long-gone king. Velstat has the ability to create quite a few combos and mix-ups with his hammer than most of the bosses we have discussed so far. Something that is not as common in Dark Souls 2, but seen more often in the newer games. Though the combos aren't extremely challenging, the change of pace will have you more on your toes. He has a decent amount of reach with his hammer and includes the occasional two-hand attack and thrust between countless swipes, backhands, including a backstep lunge that covers a good distance as well. Once at a certain amount of health, he will commence a ritual to cast dark magic at the player, which is best dealt with by running behind him and spamming him down as much as possible. He has a fair amount of health and usually isn't cheesed extremely quickly, or by any particular method I'm familiar with in a regular playthrough. You can kill him by being fairly aggressive even on a level 1 run. Number 24. The Queen. Nishandra is the smallest piece of Manus, the father of the Abyss. Long ago after his defeat in the land of Ulysil, he split into tiny fragments. As the fragments began to rejoin, they assumed a human form. She convinced her king Vendrick to cross the sea and pilfer a mighty prize from the giants. She brought a darkness to the kingdom of Drang Lake and eventually Vendrick realized something was wrong. He fled and refused to take part in Nishandra's plans any longer. Which brings us to her interaction with the player character, the heir to the throne of Wan. Like her sisters, Nadalia, Alana, and Alsana, Nishandra is a fragment of Manus' emotions. She represents wrenching desire. In the end, Vendrick could not find any way to overcome the curse that beckoned him towards the dark. He went to the undead crypt with its darkness allowing those who are cursed to find some type of rest. Not a true death, but a state where they are at peace. Nishandra's ability to inflict curse on the player alone is one of the only major conditions in the fight that would make her higher ranking compared to some of the more straight up challenging boss fights. She can trap you in positions on hitless runs where if you don't think ahead, you will lose. And additionally, on regular and SL1 playthroughs, the drain from the orb she spawns can still push you into areas where you literally fall off the edge within the arena. This combined with her laser attack from a distance and occasional explosions make her pretty decent at zoning the player character. If you don't know what zoning means, it just means that you control space. Her Scythe of Want doesn't reach that far, but has some odd animations, which seem to be best dealt with by sticking close by. One of the easiest scythe attacks to punish is the single overhead attack that she does, but most of the engagements are fairly slow and pretty easily paced at close range. Number 25. The Giant Lord is the King of Giants. Following the counsel of Nishandra and in an effort to subjugate the giants and claim their powerful souls for his own, King Vendrick crossed the northern seas, took some giants prisoner, and then brought them back to his castle, clapped in irons. King Vendrick studied the souls of these captured giants. He used them to construct golems and gave them to his brother, Lord Aldia, to further his research in overcoming the curse. In retaliation for his misguided barbarism, the King of Giants crossed the seas and conquered Drang Lake, bringing wrath and ruin to the entire kingdom. The Giant Lord was defeated by an unknown warrior we know as the player character. His beaten and broken remains were then dragged beneath the Great Fort Stronghold, where he was bound and sealed away in chains. Many seasons came and went, and the Giant Lord prepared for his final rests. When the Giants fell, they grew into trees. But this was not Giant Lord's fate. His soul remained magnificent, a testament to his former strength. Souls of Giants are different to that of other creatures. There is a balance in their composition between light and dark. Many of the souls we encounter are either composed of pure light burning very brightly, composed of darkness with a faint glimmer of light in the middle, and there are some that burn explicitly dark. By comparison, the giant souls are more harmonious in design. With the giants being part of the regeneration cycle, they are seemingly eternal and perhaps were able to break the cycle of the undead curse. The giant lord drops a giant's kinship, indicating a blood relationship. It allows the player to activate the golems in the bridge in the abyss surrounding the throne of one. Golems were created by King Vendrick with the souls of giants, so perhaps these particular golems only respond to those who are akin to the giants. 
The throne itself has a seat large enough for a giant, but is far too big for the player character in which you can see in the final cutscene. Giant Lord is massive overall, and his sword can reach you as you approach him far before any damage can be dealt with melee. You also have to traverse a battlefield of catapults that launch explosives in two separate locations and defeat two giants that are smaller along the way. There are some regular enemies that help in fighting them, but don't do a whole lot. The best bet is to use the catapult's timing and lure the small giants into the fire to kill them. This can be challenging at times, though there is a part of a statue that one of the projectiles from a distance will dismantle, making it roll towards us directly and potentially taking out one or both of the giants. This part has enough variables that even on a hitless run, as calculated as they can be, sometimes I would warp out of the giant's memory, only to return a second time and try to set up all these cheesy methods once again. Once you are finally within striking distance of the giant lord, the hardest part of the fight is that you can't actually see his hands while poking away at his ankles. You need to learn the cues of what type attack he's doing, and how to bait them from less information than normal, which once learned is fine, but can sometimes throw you off. Alternatively, you can stand up on the platform beside him and bait the sword attacks, while using magic or projectiles, but I'm not good at this method whatsoever. Giant Lord also has a hitbox so large that I've seen some people die from 5 feet beside his blade and not even get close to visually touching it. Number 26. Lord Aldia is King Vendrick's elder brother. He aided his brother in founding the Kingdom of Drang Lake, but then he secluded himself in his manor, searching for the secrets of life, viewing the undead as the key to finding it. Through his experiments, Aldia sought to learn the nature of the undead curse and to dissect the essence of fate. Due to a dispute on the research methods of how to end the curse, Vendrick locked Aldia away in his keep. It was there that Aldia kept giants in his manor and attempted to recreate a dragon, but after some time, he was not heard from again. With the release of Scholar of the First Sin, it is revealed that Aldia did not become the ancient dragon, but was transfigured into a blob-like creature that appears to be composed of fire, witch tree branches, and a glowing red eye. His dialogue expresses outward rage at Gwyn the Lord of Cinder, who was referred to by Aldia as the Lord of Light. The scholar describes how the Lord of Sunlight expelled the darkness and began the cycle of light and dark. This cycle, this curse, forced men to assume a fleeting form, reverting them back to their hollow form. They became less than what they were, and to Aldia, this is the first sin mentioned in his name. He claims that men were props, and no matter how exquisite, a lie will always remain a lie. The anger is audible in his voice, an expression of his fury at the first linking of the flame. In the boss fight itself, Aldia will teleport himself away from the player after a certain amount of time and protect himself with the fire surrounding his form momentarily. He can spawn balls of fire that track the player and also create pillars coming up from the ground that are made of the tree material that's part of him, sort of resembling Chaos Firestorm Pyromancy. The branches that come from his body also conjure a massive fireball that's hurled towards the player. Aldia isn't the hardest fight by any means, but on countless different types of runs, it definitely takes some patience. Especially on level 1. Occasionally you can be close to him while the branches are rooting up from the ground and they'll miss you, and you can deal damage simultaneously. But mostly you'll be hitting him a little bit, then getting out of the area and repeating. Number 27. The Looking Glass Knight is a plate-wearing, specular monstrosity that awaits challengers at the end of King's Passage. King Vendrick's lieutenant, charged with testing the ability of those who seek to serve among Stranglake's royal knights. Upon the collapse of the kingdom and Vendrick's disappearance, he still continues to fulfill his duty long afterwards. King Vendrick tried all manner of things to purge the curse that threatened his kingdom, but eventually failed and fled to the King's Passage to never return. The Looking Glass Knight now serves to prevent anyone who would pursue the Runaway King. He uses the King's Mirror as a shield, likely created in Aldia's Keep, as we find a number of similar mirrors on the walls. Looking Glass Knight is known as the Mirror Knight in the E3 demo of Dark Souls 2, which is one of the most unique bosses in the sense that he actually puts up a good fight considering the pace and the mechanics of Dark Souls 2, and on top of that, includes a gimmick of summoning another player character or if you're online an actual person to invade the fight and help him defeat you. This mechanic was used on Old Monk and Demon Souls and made a comeback for half Light in the Ring City DLC of Dark Souls 3, but in comparison both of these bosses suck compared to the vibes, design, and moveset of Mirror Knight. 
He can call upon lightning from the sky with his blade and utilize it for different attacks. His base sword attacks have combos that are actually more advanced and cool than most bosses in the game, and even though he has a humanoid design, his size makes him unique. His shield itself will actually cause your weapon to do the rebound animation upon hitting it similar to if you attacked a wall. This is very risky to have happen on a run where you can't take damage because it can leave you wide open. It also protects certain angles of his body, making the access to damaging him more limited than some of these enemy types. In Phase 2, when he calls his phantom from the shield, you're going to have quite the time whether it's an offline battle or he has summoned an actual player to help. During this time when fighting the phantom, he will chase you down and join, or spam lightning at you from a distance. Number 28. Once King Vendrick defeated the Four Great Ones, he built the kingdom that is now Drang Lake upon their souls and has watched over the land since ages long ago. Before Vendrick condemned his own elder brother to Aldia's keep, Vendrick and Aldia both sought the truth, but through different means, and their differences resulted in the end of the relationship. Nishandra warned him of the looming threat across the seas of the giants. Then he built Drang Lake Castle for Nishandra, on top of what is supposed to be the first flame, which she desired. By the time we find Vendrick, he has gone completely hollow. Though he still wears the king's crown and carries the ruler's sword, the item description of the sword reads, The great king shut himself away and was soon reduced to a mere shell. Just what was it that he yearned to protect? Vendrick's defense without the use of a giant soul was known to be one of the hardest things in the game originally, and when the non-scholar edition of Dark Souls 2 is fresh on the scene, I remember seeing so many comments of people giving up on this. He will divide your damage by 32 by default, 16 with a single giant soul, 8 with 2 giant souls, and then 4 for 3, 2 for 4, with 5 being completely undivided. Having at least four giant souls seems to be the sweet spot when fighting Vendrick, but if you are newer and unaware of this mechanic, remember that the giant souls that you've already used will not respawn until the next playthrough. This makes Vendrick very tricky to those unaware, and even at his weakest, his moveset and large ruler sword makes him quite punishing. 29. The Smelter Demon is a mass of iron that has been given a soul and therefore life. When the old Iron King acquired the power to grant life to heaps of iron, through use of his scorching iron scepter, he molded a great array of metallic automatons. The Smelter Demon was likely created to be one of the king's puppets. Magus Eigel, a loyal follower of the old Iron King, sought to grant fire a will of its own. It's possible that Smelter Demon is a creation of both the old Iron King and Eigel, as it appears to be based on a minotaur which was Eigel's idol. The earth spouted fire and a beast arose from the flames. The short-sighted king was incinerated by the creature in one swing, and his castle devoured in a sea of flames, sinking into a pool of iron. The king sunk below the scorching earth, his soul being possessed by the things that lurk below. The smelter demon now haunts the castle that sunk into a pool of iron. Smelter demon was always a harder boss for me to kill back when I was new to Dark Souls 2, but even on a hitless and damageless run nowadays, it requires the player to stay at a distance in the second phase due to its fire effect damaging the player constantly when in close range. This is best dealt with by use of poison arrows or magic strong enough to kill it quickly. Casually this can be frustrating when you aren't great at positioning and get cornered then need to heal but are punished while doing so. Furthermore, the health burn effect he emits is brutal with the amount of health you have for level 1 unless you are a seasoned player and know how to navigate. Though Smelter Demon's arena is not the smallest I've ever seen, it isn't large either, and I feel like that was definitely the intention. Number 30. The Old Iron King was born a lord. He may have been a lord in the land of Alken, a land known to have a strong rivalry with Ven. At some point, this lowly lord with limited resources decided to rage a war against the kingdom of Ven. From the far east came Sir Alone, an unusual knight who decided to serve this little-known established lord. Sir Alone quickly became the lord's most trusted knight. Dedicated to his lord's request, Sir Alone trained the lord's soldiers in the martial techniques of his land, and these warriors became the lord's knights. With the help of Sir Alone, and by utilizing every resource he could muster, the lord was able to take over the land of Ven from its previous occupants, and in doing so, crowned himself the king. But in the aftermath of the war, it was clear that the new king would have difficulty maintaining control of the region. He had spent everything in his attempt to gain control of Ven, and the land was now wasted. 
It was at this low point that a miracle occurred. The Scorching Iron Scepter was found. Ruling from his tower, which would later become known as Broom Tower, the king was able to activate contraptions by transferring heat to Broom Tower and was retitled as Iron King. He began entertaining dubious and eccentric guests from faraway lands, many of whom were frauds, only trying to appeal to the king's vain nature. It's believed during this time, amongst the crowd, Magus Igel emerged, becoming a member of the king's court. The old Iron King also kept a display of his vast collection of weapons. These weapons were designed to show off his strength to the world and his guests. His tower produced for him endless amounts of iron which he used to create his iron soldiers, weapons, armor, an entire keep made of iron, a massive idol in the shape of a bull in honor of Magus Igel, and it is said he attempted to create a dragon. With the creation of his iron keep, it is likely Old Iron King changed his seat of rule from Broom Tower to his new keep, constructing a new throne for himself. Upon creating the Smelter Demon, the Old Iron King did not realize what would happen. The fact it could choose to turn upon its master was an oversight, and with that, the creation incinerated the king immediately. Fire spouted from the earth, and the king's body became a vessel of lava. This lava rose up and consumed the king's iron keep. His body sunk far below the earth and met an ancient soul that merged with the king's forming a demonic-like being that resided within the lava, awaiting for any who would approach the altar. Iron King's arena is a very small one, despite the size of the boss itself. It's able to only be hit with projectiles or carefully poked at whenever his hands are in range. There's a small hole in the middle of the arena you can fall into, and he's also capable of swiping you off the side into the surrounding lava. The fire he breathes makes it necessary to be careful in which your placement is, and his fist attacks can have terrible hitboxes at times, even though it might look like you've escaped. If you fight him as an early great soul without leveling a ton, I would say this is one of the most frustrating bosses in the game due to all the conditions. There is a glitch that I've seen in the original Dark Souls 2, where he walks away from the arena into the distance and eventually dies, but I've only witnessed it once and never heard of it again, sadly. Number 31. A duo that reside within the Throne of Want Colosseum. The Throne Defender appears to be a male and has a very long white beard, indicating the timeline of his service. The Throne Watcher appears to be female, though the item descriptions associated with the Throne Watcher call it a he. This gender confusion appears to be a mistranslation on the part of From Software, as the items which give a specific gender in English don't have any gender pronouns in the Japanese. The Throne Watcher also has a feminine appearance and a woman's voice. Both contain souls steeped in dark. This may be because Vendrick never sat upon the throne of Want and Link the Fire, therefore allowing the fire to go out, introducing the Abyss. We know that the proximity to the Abyss corrupts a soul, and this seems to fit their description. The two roles suggest that one looks outward from the throne in defense, and one looks towards the throne in observation, though they both attack you upon entering their chamber. From their roles and positions, it seems likely that they are awaiting someone who is strong enough to take the throne of Want. Throne Watcher and Defender are easily, if not one of the hardest bosses out of the entire base game, and even get close to the difficulty of the DLC bosses. On a hitless run, they're the most risky boss fight in the entire run. Most of the game for any percent challenge runs feels like a breeze compared to the battle taking place in the throne. You can use projectiles such as bows and poison to make both of them a little bit easier, but the tricky part is that no matter the strategy, without insane sheer damage, they have the ability to heal and upon doing so, especially in lower damage fights or on higher new game cycles, this can loop over and over. I remember on my first challenge run with Fists, this took so long to complete because of that exact mechanic. I burned through all my various healing items in Estus just before barely succeeding. Watcher is a bit more agile with combo attacks, thrusts, and can backflip to escape and buff her weapon. The Defender has a shield that can deflect your attacks if you hit them, creating a situation similar to the Looking Glass Knight mentioned before, where when you attack the shield, your character will rebound as if you hit a wall. If you rebound off his shield by accident due to a bad angle of attack, you can be left open. Only this time, Watcher can punish you even if he's not fast enough to deliver the next blow, unlike a regular single enemy fight. Watcher can also shoot a very fast projectile from her sword when dealing with the Defender that needs to be looked out for when engaging with him. He also buffs his weapon with lightning, and is tankier than his counterpart. Because of Defender living up to his name and actually being a bit tankier, I would say killing a Watcher first is always a better method because then the healing loop is less likely to catch you where they're both alive. 
Number 32. The Dark Lurker is a being shrouded in mystery. What it actually is, is unknown, whether it be a golem, a part dragon, or the remnants of something else. The Dark Lurker lives in the dark chasm of old. It awaits one who would light the torches in the three fragments of the abyss across Drang Lake and thereby agitates the dark into action. After lighting the torch in each of the dark chasms, and defeating the phantoms there, the player will drop down to exit the world, but instead of exiting, they will be ambushed by the Dark Lurker. The Dark Lurker's soul is not dark like Veldstadt, Raim, Throne Knights, or any of the Sisters of Dark. It is a light-colored soul. The Dark Lurker itself also has a high resistance to dark damage. These two details may indicate that the Dark Lurker is not native to the Abyss, and has instead invaded it. The player is rewarded for destroying the Dark Lurker by Dark Diver Grandal, and his purpose seems to be to spread the dark in Drang Lake. Both Dark Lurker and Dragon Chime rewarded from it have spent so much time in the Chasm of Old, and yet they don't appear to have become infused with dark. The Dark Lurker has a light soul, and the Dragon Chime maintains purity, despite it sitting for a long time in the Dark Chasm. It's possible the connection to the dragons has kept it from darkening. Capable of wielding various forms of magic, teleportation, and cloning of itself, it can hurl projectiles of pure dark, create darker great swords, become invisible, and summon forth orbs of fire that will track the player. Its ability to create a clone of itself is similar to that of four kings from Lordran. This boss fight can be tricky to learn for newcomers and extremely annoying to actually access. This was an absolute nightmare on level 1 runs when I didn't have as much experience on the DLCs and I had not ran hitless any percent. Without using the method of one cycling the fight, meaning to kill it before it multiplies into two enemies, it becomes hectic with all the portals as they open and shoot orbs with big explosions and simultaneous laser attacks, similar to Nishandra's but while flying above the character, making it much harder to position as they can become off camera. With enough damage, the best method seems to be sticking close to the initial copy of Dark Lurker and letting his Dark Sword attack go over your head, and the Dark Missile he shoots as well. It should give enough extra opportunity to kill him faster. Number 33. Alana is a child of Dark, one of the Abyss spawn made from Manus and his Dark Soul. Like her sisters, Nishandra, Nadalia, and Alsana, Alana is a fragment of Manus' emotions representing anger. Squalid describes something that is extremely dirty and unpleasant, most often due to neglect. She was largely ignored by the sunken king who focused on his eternal sanctum and the worship of the slumbering dragon. Perhaps she grew bitter due to his neglect and allowed herself to decay, all while plotting vengeance against her king. There is a chance someone was working on the inside plotting against the king, allowing Yorg to make it through the path guarding the slumbering dragon that she battles you in front of. It's also likely that after her creation, she desired the power of the Sunken King and courted him for his considerable power with a set of her own motives. Alana is amassing souls in anticipation for the coming day of vengeance. She is gathering more and more power so that she can either carry out vengeance or so that she can defend herself against vengeance. In a similar way that Alsana devotes herself to a ritual to escape the coming apocalypse. We know that Alana sings to the dragon the same song as the Sanctum Priestesses to enable the dragon's deep slumber. Dragons do not typically become infested with poison, and it's possible their song cast a spell upon Sin, which is responsible for Sin's current condition. Alana can summon multiple different types of mobs, including skeletons, the piglets found in Majula, and even Veldstadt. The combination of fighting her and Veldstadt together is arguably the hardest combo, and while she can be destroyed quickly with enough damage and a precise setup before she summons the first wave of enemies, she becomes tricky the longer the fight goes on. On my first soul level 1 run, this had me stuck for longer than I'd like to admit. Number 34. Ivory King was served by seven of these massive saber-toothed tigers, indicating Ava's power in terms of its relevance and duty. Invisible to the naked eye, the only way to actually see Ava is through the Eye of the Priestess, belonging to the first priestess who watched over Elium Lois. These priestesses work to contain the old chaos. By the time the player reaches Elium Lois, they are gone. Ava's soul can be crafted into the Ivory Straight Sword. What connection Ava may have to Sir Fabian is unknown, as Sir Fabian was said to have delved into chaos in an attempt to exterminate the horrors that dwelt there. 
Abba's ability to manipulate ice is similar to that of Alsana, who can create ice to protect her and calm the blizzard that swirls in Eliamlois. Even when fighting Ava after obtaining the Eye of the Priestess, it's a little hard to see clearly amidst the blizzard that rages on. The swipes that Ava throws from outside in are hard to see on certain angles, and without good timing they might catch you off guard. The tiger will run away throughout the fight, then charge back in and take a giant lunge at you. It can generate ice spikes that will hurl at the player similar to homing soul mass, and create an AoE attack in the form of an explosion around its body. It seems to be very good at punishing the player when you are poking at its side or almost behind it, and doesn't let you stay in that position for long. Number 35. Long ago, the Sunken King created a grand city, and an eternal sanctum, to shelter and worship the magnificence of Sin. The sanctum appeared to be a solemn temple, but it was filled with devilish creatures that ensured no trespassers. The Sunken King established an order of priestesses who sang to preserve the dragon's deep slumber, and the great dragon continued to sleep soundly. That was until Honorable Sir Yorg, the leader of the Drake Blood Knights, invaded Shelva and set siege to the Eternal Sanctum, seeking the blood of the Eternal Dragon. The black armored Drake Blood Knights, who came from a land long forgotten, believed that fresh dragon blood was sacred, and that by obtaining it, they could achieve a true understanding of life transcending their own banal existence. The Sunken King Sanctum Knights renounce their own flesh so that they may eternally guard the Sanctum from Sir Yorg and his Drake Blood Knights, but their efforts were futile. While Sin slumbered, Sir Yorg disturbed its rest with a single great strike of his spear. With a flash of steel, Sir Yorg's spear pierced the dragon's belly and drew the blood that he had coveted. Instead of being killed, Sin spewed forth poison that had long brewed within him, Blanketing the entire city in a miasmic cloud of death, Sir Yorg disappeared into the Eternal Sanctum, the Sunken King defeated by Yorg, drowned in the poison, and the Drake Blood Knights sunk into the Sanctum along with them. This dragon, when airborne, is most of the difficulty in the fight's pacing and the risk for different runs. The explosive balls of poisonous fire it launches at you from high above can end the fight altogether without enough planning. You can cut his tail, making it much easier to avoid the tail attacks themselves, but altogether Sin is fast and has a lot of control over the momentum in the fight. His regular swipes, stomps, and fire breathing require good timing and positioning, and he has a decent amount of health and damage that he can deal to the player. Number 36. Afflicted Grave Robber, Ancient Soldier Varg, and Sarah the Old Explorer. There are no item descriptions or dialogue regarding these three warriors. From their worn items and armor, we can guess that they were all grave robbers come to the Sanctum City in search of treasure. We know that the Sunken Kingdom had troubles with grave robbers after the fall of the Sunken King, due to numerous clues like the rooms with empty chests and the presence of Flynn's Ring. The afflicted grave robber wears the Alva set and wields Berserker Blades. The afflicted grave robber groans with a female voice when hit, so it cannot be Alva. We know that Alva found enlightenment at Zuli's side, so if we were to encounter Alva, even a hollowed Alva, it would make sense that Zuli would be there too. Ancient soldier Varg wears Havel's set and wields Havel's dragon tooth and great shield. How he came to be in possession of these items is unclear. Sarah the Old Explorer wears black leather armor, Lucatil's mask, and wields the Dragon Slayer great bow with an S-Stock. The black leather armor is worn by those with ill intent. How Sarah came to possess a mask just like Lucatil's is unknown, though it may indicate that the mask was not unique to Lucatil and may have been a duplicate. The Dragon Slayer Great Bow is a weapon wielded by the Knights of Gwyn in the Age of Fire. How it came into Sarah's possession is also not spoken of. We know their quest came to an end in the Sunken Kingdom, where they are hollowed. This fight is the most annoying in the entire game, period. I hope someone in the comments says it's not, because the comments on those comments... Whew, there's going to be some controversy. I'm telling you. A lot of the strategies best serving the victory against these three NPCs are to use range attacks like the bow, or relatively fast casting magic and then running away, falling into one of the pits as they chase you, and then running them in a loop. This isn't the most challenging thing on a technical level, but even with all the preparation and good setup, it will be lengthy and boring after a while. Alternatively, you can get in their faces and mix up the fight a bunch, but best of luck. 
I hope anyone that is doing this all bosses at level 1 on the game for the first time doesn't give up on this fight, because it's just unfun. Less fun than Half-Light on Dark Souls 3 kind of vibes, but it's definitely worth completing the whole DLC. Number 37. The blue smelter demon, just like the red one, is a mass of iron that has been given a soul, and therefore life. When the old Iron King acquired the power to grant life to heaps of iron, through the use of the scorching scepter he molded a great array of metallic automatons. The Iron Keep Smelter Demon emits a red flame, does fire damage, and has a broken horn. While the Smelter Demon of the Iron Passage emits a blue flame and does magic damage. It's likely that these two Smelter Demons are contemporaries. The King may have made the first one imbued with sorcery potentially, which was the tool to bring his puppets to life, then imbued the other demon with pyromancy, which led to his demise. I'm all for reskins of slightly cool bosses at minimum, but the passageway to get to this fight is pure chaos on FromSoft's behalf. They really did not want us to have fun at all. The best part of this boss, even though it's harder than the normal Smelter Demon, is that it also can be poisoned, and you can use the same strategy that I mentioned earlier in the list for the Fire Demon. Using arrows or magic at range is the best solution if you don't want to take any damage from the passive damage it gives you upon being close to it, but be aware it'll buff itself pretty early and can corner you with plunge attacks, explosions, and the absolutely insane reach that it gains on its sword. This fight on a level 1 run absolutely sucks, and forgive me if I'm incorrect about this, but I think the overhead slam attack actually has more lingering damage than the normal smelter demon attack, making it less consistent to roll. Let me know in the comments. Either way, good luck to even getting here. Number 38. Raim, eventually known to be Fume Knight, was considered a traitor to King Vendrick after his defeat at the hands of Veldstadt. Raim was an agile swordsman. He and Veldstadt, the royal Aegis, were known as the left and right arms of King Vendrick. Raim came to Broom Tower in search of greater strength. He found it there, from a newfound mother, like Nishandra, a child of dark who haunted Broom Tower, and gave Raim true purpose as her champion. Raim had the ability to expunge or remove Nadalia from Broom Tower, but instead he chose to live in the company of Nadalia, Bride of Ash, likely because he had become infatuated with her. Raim was imbued with the power of dark, a part of Nadalia's soul became housed in his body, and she haunts his weapons. Because of this, Raim's soul fell into darkness. He resides at the bottom of Broom Tower, guarding the room that contains Nadalia's original body and the crown of the Iron King. Fume Knight has the ability to spawn magic orbs that spread out towards the character, leaving fairly tight spacing between them and an array of combos with his smaller greatsword and ultra greatsword in the other hand. Once he buffs the larger sword, it becomes hard to deal with and overall his agility and speed prove to be a challenge versus a lot of other Dark Souls 2 bosses. He will also become even harder if you wear the Velstat helmet into his fight and get angry, buffing his weapon immediately. Number 39. Two of the seven beasts who served the Ivory King. Each of these beasts was given a specific task. We know of only three beasts that remain. Ava, Lud, and Zalin. Lud and Zalin were tasked with the mercy killing of exiles in the frigid outskirts, an endless frozen landscape with a constant blizzard raging violently. These two creatures seemed to await anyone who would wander into their domain. They do not both attack you at once, as they seem confident that Lud, the first to attack you, will be strong enough to deal with any that come their way. That is until you hurt him enough, and Zalin is forced to step in. The two beasts seem to have a bond, as when one is defeated the other will go into a rage. The appearances of Lud and Zalin are identical to each other, but different to Ava, being steeped in dark energy. This perhaps explains why they were given a task that drew them so far away from the general populace of Elium Lois. The whole objective of this fight is to kill Lude before Zalan enters, and this can be hard to do depending on how accurate you are and your damage. One saving grace is that since you already would have had to have killed Ava before attempting Lude and Zalan, the base moveset would have been learned enough to help you in this fight, which is mostly similar. They do become more dangerous when they power up. The fight is mostly just Ava times two. Good luck actually making it to the boss fight because you can barely see, and Frigid Outskirts is notorious for being the worst area in any of the games. Number 40. 
Sir alone came from an eastern land and chose to serve a lord that went on to become the old Iron King. He became the lord's most trusted knight. He was a master of the quick draw sword technique, and out of respect for his new lord, Sir alone trained the old Iron King's men. After Iron King's fall into depravity, Sir alone disappeared. He was said to have deserted his king after bearing witness to his downfall, setting out again in search of lands unknown. Sir alone was known to be very honorable in battle, bowing to the player before commencing, and will even commit seppuko if the player defeats him without taking any damage. He is arguably the fastest boss in the entire game, and with his sword speeds ranging for different attacks, and him being able to cover a great distance quickly while tracking you, he is terrifying to fight on the first encounter. He also has the fastest plunge attack I have ever seen. No matter how skilled you are, I would say that Sir alone always puts up a good battle, and like Smelter Demon and King's Pets, it is an absolute disaster to actually reach his fog gate. Number 41. The Ivory King was once the highest ranking knight from the land of Ferosa. He had a reputation for being proud, ever merciful, and for being the first to swing his sword in times of need, be it for his homeland or for his people. With his magnificent soul, he built Elium Lois, a place made to contain the spread of chaos. He also built a grand cathedral to appease the raging flame, placing his throne on the mouth of the old chaos, serving as the first line of defense. Throughout his life, he devoted himself to the protection of the land of Elium Lois. The king kept his expression from the people by never removing his helmet and carved his face into it, inspiring his knights to do the same. The king constructed the ramparts, a garrison house, and golems to guard the ramparts, so nothing would ever escape Elium Lois. To this day, the golems continue following the king's orders. One day, Alsana, a sister of Dark, came to his land seeking the Ivory King. The king offered her his protection. Alsana was beloved by the king and found a place at his side. As time wore on, the king sensed a degradation in his soul. Alsana claims that the king was drained of vigor, and the Elium Lois description states that the king was drained of his strength. He decided to make one last attempt at subduing the old chaos. Before leaving, he gifted a sword to Alsana inscribed with the name of the land, Elium Lois. The sword is two intertwining blades, one light and one dark. Whatever remained of his kingdom was also gifted to Alsana. The Ivory King then departed, and with his faithful knights entered the old chaos, never to be seen again. Ivory King's boss fight is still the most unique souls battle I can recall, with it feeling like an all-out war. There's the Lois Knights that you rescue that never went into the old chaos, along with fighting against the charred knights that emerge from the portals along with Ivory King himself. Once Ivory King enters, you get the idea that he is very serious without even needing to play further. This boss does an incredibly good job at seeming epic without needing to be too over the top, although it would be nice if you could just fight him one on one after the first time, since all the charred knights having to be fought every single time becomes monotonous. As stated in the lore, his ability in combat is demonstrated well with aerial attacks, combos, and even a lunge that grabs the player. His insanely far backsteps and spacing game sets him apart from most bosses aside from Sir alone. He can plunge his sword into the ground creating an explosion of ice spikes that triggers fairly quickly with a decent area of effect. Once the sword he has is buffed with magic, it becomes the longest weapon in the entire game next to Smelter Demon's sword when buffed. Though the king as an individual enemy himself isn't much more advanced than the hardest bosses we've talked about in this list, the lead up to fighting him that's required every single time easily makes it the hardest on any particular playthrough of the run, especially on level 1, because the amount of charred knights that you have to fight at one time with low damage and health. On a leveled character, patience is still needed as getting careless and spamming will kill you quickly. With this being the largest tier list I've ever made, I must say it was extremely exciting to make and share with you guys. Please leave a comment on what you would change with the order, and maybe include any info that I missed. Before we wrap this up completely, if you happen to like unedited videos as well as these types of videos, check out my second channel that has unedited content that doesn't make it on the main one, and also check out my music channel while you're at it. Thank you so much for watching, and take care guys.